have become operational, the term pitch-up has become common and widely spread in the Air Force. Unfortunately, the complete story of pitch-up has not kept pace with wild rumors concerning the phenomenon. The result? Some pretty weird interpretations of pitch-up among Century Series fighter pilots. This film is intended to clarify the phenomenon as it applies to flying the Voodoo Series aircraft. Let's begin by saying that pitch-up is definitely an undesirable trait. It's easy to steer clear of or to recover from, but anyone who shrugs it off unknowingly as no sweat is just plain crazy. It's only fair to point out that the operational analyst is right in saying that pitch-up does not reduce the tactical capability of the weapon system any more than does the stall boundary. And the engineer is also right when he says that aerodynamically, restriction due to pitch up is a small price to pay for advantages gained in weight saving, performance, trim free flying qualities and maneuvering capabilities. In the final analysis, however, it's up to the pilot to get the job done, getting the most from the aircraft without overextending yourself into problem areas is simple once you know and understand the full story on pitch up. First, let's look into why pitch-up occurs. On any swept-wing aircraft approaching stall, the center of lift moves forward as the wingtips stall out, causing a nose-up pitching moment. In bringing the aircraft closer to stall, we are also increasing angle of attack, which results in greater downwash forces on the tail. This also increases nose-up tendency. These phenomena have been described in the past as tucking, stick lightning, dig in, or stick reversal. Call it what you like, but it's still nose up pitching moment, and it affects the F-101 like any other swept wing aircraft. As the Voodoo approaches stall, the wingtip vortex moves inboard and increases in intensity as the angle of attack increases. When this vortex action reaches that portion of the wing which influences the tail, it imparts such a strong downwash component on the horizontal stabilator that it not only contributes to pitch up, but also renders the stabilator ineffective as an immediate recovery device. Now that we know why the voodoo pitches up, how do we know we're approaching critical regions? The key lies in the term angle of attack. From a practical standpoint, Everything your airplane does is based on angle of attack. It takes off at a known angle of attack. It flies final approach at another known angle of attack. And it pitches up at a known angle of attack. The angle of attack is that angle formed between the relative wind vector and the longitudinal axis, or you could say, the angle formed by the direction in which the airplane is moving and the direction in which the airplane is pointing. Angle of attack is affected by gross weight, indicated airspeed, and G-loading. The easiest way to visualize how we change angle of attack is to vary one item at a time, leaving the other two constant. First, let's vary weight, holding stabilized flight. The airplane requires enough lift to offset its weight, and since lift is a function of angle of attack, it will take a certain angle of attack to produce 40,000 pounds of lift for these flight conditions. 
As weight decreases, as would be the case when fuel is burned down, the airplane requires less lift to maintain the same flight conditions. Therefore, angle of attack will be reduced. Conversely, as we add weight to our example aircraft, we must increase angle of attack to give us the required additional lift. This shows that the heavier the aircraft, the closer it is flying to its stall angle of attack for any given flight condition. We can theoretically continue to add weight until the wing has reached its limit capability, at which time it will stall. Now, let's vary indicated airspeed, keeping all other conditions constant. Lift, as we pointed out before, is also a function of indicated airspeed. As the airplane is slowed down, lift will be decreased unless angle of attack is increased to maintain it. This is obvious to the pilot during an acceleration from slow to high indicated airspeed. At the start of the run, the aircraft is in a fairly nose-high, high angle of attack attitude. As speed increases, the nose-high attitude decreases, which shows that less angle of attack is needed to produce the same lift at the higher indicated airspeed. Now, let's vary G-loading, which actually means we're right back to varying weight. A 40,000-pound airplane required 40,000 pounds of lift to keep it airborne at one G flight. If we go into a 3G turn, the 40,000-pound airplane now weighs three times as much and requires 120,000 pounds of lift. With other conditions held constant, Increased angle of attack is required to produce this added lift. This increase is shown by the back pressure required to hold constant altitude in the turn. The pitch-up and spin programs consisted of over 200 fully instrumented intentional pitch-ups in the F-101A and B aircraft. Full-scale pitch-up and successful recoveries were demonstrated from low subsonic to supersonic speed from combat ceiling down to 10,000 feet altitude. Early in the F-101A program, recovery techniques were developed which were proved 100% successful. Further verification of this technique was obtained in the F-101B program, and the many pitch-ups resulting from flight test development programs which required flight near and through the pitch-up boundary. The actual pitch-up coverage shown in this film was photographed from a ground tracking camera, therefore no horizon reference is available. These tests reveal that the voodoo demonstrates three basic modes of stall performance after the critical angle of attack is exceeded. The voodoo must pitch up before it can enter any type of stall or spin gyration. Recovery from pitch up is 100% effective with a chute. However, without a chute, the aircraft will probably progress into the second phase prior to recovery. This is the so-called incipient spin, which can also be thought of as a post-stall, pre-spin gyration. At this stage, the airplane oscillates about all axes, and while looking like a violent ride, you don't feel high abnormal forces. If handbook recommended action with drag shoot is used, recovery is again 100% effective. However, if a chute is not utilized, time out of control will be lengthened considerably with resultant increase in altitude loss. Extended out of control time could possibly force you to leave the aircraft prior to recovery because of altitude considerations. Remember, if you use the handbook recovery techniques at pitch-up, which includes use of the drag chute, you'll never reach incipient spin. If the chute fails to deploy, the aircraft control action is exactly the same. Chances of recovering without the chute are best within the first few seconds following the peak of pitch-up. Therefore, complete knowledge of pilot control action is imperative, since improper use of controls without the chute can prolong the out-of-control time or even prevent recovery. The airplane can only get into the steady state spin mode if it is put there through use of rudder and aileron, and it's got to go through pitch up and post-stall gyration stages 
both of which are fully recoverable before it can get into the third or steady state spin state. McDonnell pilots ran a program in which voodoos in normal trim for various flight conditions were placed in full-scale pitch-up, after which all controls were returned to neutral. In every case, the aircraft recovered from the resultant incipient spin without a shoot, which shows that the 101 does not inherently seek steady-state spin after pitch-up, but rather tends toward recovery. The only recovery control to expedite the recovery cycle is full forward stick with neutral ailerons and rudders. As soon as you feel the nose coming up on its own, keeping rudder and ailerons neutral, start that stick forward toward the instrument panel. Chances are that you might still have stabilator effectiveness for immediate recovery, and you'll never get into full-scale pitch-up. If the aircraft continues into full-scale pitch-up, the stick is now properly positioned for pitch-up recovery. If the nose continues up, even with full forward stick, deploy the drag chute after reaching the peak of pitch-up. Don't worry about airspeed, since it will be well below 200 knots at the peak of the pitch maneuver. During the pitch-up or subsequent recovery, don't try to control yaw or roll. Remember, neutral ailerons and rudders. Recovery is almost immediate. However, it is possible that recovery will be affected in a slight yaw, which will produce a roll, since one wing will recover slightly ahead of the other. If this happens, don't use counter-roll control action. As the forward stick starts producing slight negative Gs, control should be returned smoothly to neutral, even though the aircraft might still be rolling. Any rolling action will stop on its own without pilot action. Smoothly maintain between 0 and 1 G in a dive, and slowly roll the wings to level. It is recommended that the chute be retained in the dive until it fails between 200 and 250 knots. This is not detrimental to aircraft structure in any way. Also, the aircraft should be held in its recovery dive until 350 knots before a pullout is attempted. Once you're in a full-scale pitch-up, don't hesitate to use your chute. You can't tell from aircraft action how far you are from recovery. So don't kid yourself into thinking, oh, it looks like it's about to recover, so I'll just save my chute. Besides, the handbook states the chute will be used, so it's not really a matter of pilot option. For the no-chute recovery condition, the recommended control action remains the same. As negative G is sent during recovery, the stick must be returned to neutral, even though the aircraft might still be rolling. After angle of attack is recovered, yawing and rolling oscillation will damp out within a few seconds on their own. The best chance of recovery without a chute is shortly after the peak of pitch-up, but aircraft control action is of the utmost importance, because if the full forward stick is not removed, it will drive the aircraft through recovery and stall it under negative G. If this occurs, the aircraft will snap roll, which will again cause angle of attack to increase out of control. For this reason, the stick must be brought to neutral as negative G is sent. If the chute isn't used after you reach the peak of pitch-up, the aircraft will probably yaw strongly in either direction as the nose falls through the horizon, followed by some rolling action. If recovery is not affected at this time, the yaw and rolls will change direction and rate, and the nose will oscillate relative to the horizon. This is characteristic of post-stall gyration, and all you can do is to stay loose and concentrate on proper recovery controls. Sure, it's a wild ride, but even without the chute, you have an excellent chance of recovery if you play it cool and ride it out with proper control action applied. However, don't get so absorbed in the maneuver that you neglect to monitor the minimum safe recovery altitude. There is no aircraft configuration which will speed up recovery from pitch-up or post-stall gyration. It is therefore advisable to affect recovery with gear, flaps, and speed brakes retracted. External tanks will not affect recovery. 
the engine will stall on initial pitch-up and stay that way until recovery is effective. Don't try afterburners as a recovery device. They won't deliver power and are likely to torch behind the airplane, burning off the drag chute if in use. Also, don't retard throttles to idle, since this action can place the engines in a stall condition, which can persist even after aircraft recovery. Unless afterburners were on at pitch-up, the recommended throttle action is leave them alone. Altitude loss is a difficult matter to discuss, since there are many varying situations, such as altitude at pitch-up, was chute deployed, altitude at recovery, gross weight, dive attitude at recovery, altitude required for dive recovery. However, here are some fundamentals. During post-stall gyrations, the airplane drops about 18,000 feet a minute. Average out-of-control time with chute is four seconds. Control will be gained in a dive, so altitude for dive recovery must be considered. Dive recovery charts show that from the worst possible condition, a 90-degree dive at 200 knots, it takes 6,000 feet to achieve straight and level flight starting at 10,000 feet, 9,000 feet to recover from 20,000, and 12,000 to recover starting at 30,000 feet. Average altitude loss for drag chute recoveries to level flight was obtained from a study of all pitch-ups recorded. A pitch-up from 40,000 feet requires 10,000 feet to regain level flight. From lower altitude pitch-ups, the altitude required for recovery to level flight becomes progressively less. So much for recovery techniques. Now, how do we stay away from it? All the rules boil down to our earlier discussion of angle of attack. The heavier the gross weight, the less G you can pull for a given indicated airspeed. And the slower the indicated airspeed, the less G you can pull for a given gross weight. Disregarding pitch control systems, the airplane itself gives adequate buffet warning below 0.9 indicated Mach numbers, warning of approach to critical angles of attack. Supersonically, where no buffet warning is available, the knee pad cards show the number of Gs you can pull for a given indicated airspeed. It's an easy rule of thumb to remember. Know it well. Of course, you must consider pitch rate. The voodoo represents a lot of mass, and once that mass is in upward motion, inertia gets into the act. The faster you rotate, the greater the inertial overshoot tendency will be. In short, smooth control action is mandatory. Don't force the voodoo around. Fly it smoothly. Finally, there's airspeed bleed-off to be familiar with. When you look at your indicated airspeed to determine how many G's you can pull in a turn, remember that the added induced drag of the turn will start that airspeed unwinding unless power is added or altitude loss to compensate for it. As the indicated airspeed bleeds off, so does your G potential. So don't back yourself into trouble. Well, that's it. In order to get the optimum operational capability from your aircraft, you've got to know all its characteristics, good and bad. If you as a pilot know these characteristics, you will know and respect pitch-up as applied to the voodoo, and it will never cause you trouble.